Hello and welcome to the Daily Mill for Wednesday, the 1st of March 2023. In today's Mill News, the club have issued an update for the Norwich game at the weekend. Uh, this is from the club's official website. Uh, Mill will take on Norwich City in the Skybet Championship on Saturday, the 4th of March, kick off 3 pm, with limited tickets remaining in certain areas of the den. Currently, the Docker stand is sold out, apart from a very limited number of tickets in certain blocks. The Xanthus Flamme stand, in which adults need to purchase an entrance stadium with juniors under the age of 16. Blocks in the Barry Kitchener stand are also sold out, uh, except for I think block 6, there's, there's some left in there. The limited tickets remain in, in the lower tier in block 6. Oh, yeah, in the upper tier. Uh, limited tickets remain, meanwhile, in all blocks within a cold flow main stand. Yes, I said this uh, many, many a video ago that if the results keep on happening and if the team's getting in the playoffs, that the fans will come out in their droves, uh, especially with the attacking football that they're playing. Uh, well, apart from the last two games, but hey ho, we got the results, so that's not too bad. But yeah, with the attacking play that we've got with the investment in the team that's been made by John Berrelson, thank you very much sir, um, Zion Fleming 12 goals, Tom Bradshaw 12 goals, um, Oliver Burke gets signed, what, what more gets signed in January, um, yeah the fans the fans can see what's happening and they like it, they, they want to they wanna be a part of it, they, they feel like there's something happening, there's a buzz around the place and they want to get involved, so it's Wednesday, the game's in three days, and the tickets are starting to set up, which is good. Because this, and again, this is a good game, this is a big game against the team that was, uh, many said would be uh, the team that would win, win the league this year. Well, they're a long way off that, and, and they let one of their managers go. But since then, they've kind of rebounded, and if they beat us, uh, on Saturday they can go above us and we might fall out of the playoffs again which in the, in the long scheme of things doesn't really matter because it's just about being there at the end of the season but this is a test of where we're at we just at home against Sheffield United at home against Burnley and now at home against Norwich um, can we do it but it's we're getting worn down by all these injuries every game. Someone's missing out. Someone's uh, someone's getting affected. So we shall see. But the fans are certainly going to play their part on, on Saturday as they make a lot of noise, make a very intimidating atmosphere at the den as Norwich comes to town. Now, further afield, uh, the week after, the Reading game sold out. Uh, the first day of it going on sale to members, tickets sold out. I think within half an hour. Uh, yeah. Now, coach travels also sold out, and we I think we got an initial allocation of something like two thousand three hundred or something like that. And it said on this story, obviously they they've edited it to to say that it's sold out because they had all the selling details. But it, it did say it was a, an initial allocation. And it looks like some people have thrown the ticket off this, like, is there going to be more now? Because usually in the past when they say initial allocation, if it sells out so well, the, the club will normally re release another 500, another 1,000. Like I said, this is what I've just said, like the fans getting involved and um, supporting the team. Not only that, but I believe this year, this trip to Reading, uh, now is the first one uh, with a direct railway connection from South East London to Reading. Although, obviously, Reading Stadium, they've moved their stadium out into the uh, way out of the centre of Reading. Um, yeah, you can get a train at Abbey Wood or Woolwich and sit on the train for 90 minutes and then at the other end, you get out of Reading. It's the first time the Elizabeth line has, has opened that we can do it. So that means that this game is basically as accessible 
as the QPR game or any other game in London. Uh, well, more or less, like I said, the stadium's way out of town. Um, but yeah, it's literally on the railway line. It's on well, the Elizabeth line is technically uh, a tube line, sort of, kind of. It goes the the bit that goes through central London is a tube. But now you don't have to uh, faff about and go to Paddington and go through central London and all that stuff. You can just go to Abbey Wood, go to Woolwich, um, go to the Greggs at Abbey Wood. Uh, go to the off license. Sit on, sit on the sit on the train with a nice little picnic of a steak, bake, and uh, can of Stella, and then ninety minutes time when all, all your all your drinks been drunk, you you're there and ready. Um, so it's no surprise it's selling out. But where's the extra tickets? Will we get any? Well, it's coming out today. I'm just going to share this because I'm going to make a point. Like, so a couple of was it a couple of seasons ago, Reading got uh, got in a bit of trouble with their finances with the league and stuff. They weren't following the rules, so then the EFL gave them a, a six points suspended penalty deduction, and gave them a list of rules that they had to follow specifically for them. And it turns out now that they haven't been doing that. So they're basically on, on uh, special probation. It looks like that there could be another um, hearing, uh, disciplinary conduct, and if they get in trouble again, they're looking at more points deduction and actually the suspended one being being applied. So there could be a points deduction this season of maybe up to twelve points for Reading. Or maybe uh, next season, uh, if uh, ha depending how it goes. But so Reading need to make money because they're in trouble. So give us the fucking tickets. You've given us two thousand three hundred. The stadium holds like four thousand, or the stand where the EOA fights are. You can't give us another thousand tickets. I mean, come on. Man. You're seriously in fucking trouble. You need the money. We Mill fans, a lot of Mill fans missed out on this trip. They want to go. And a lot of them are saying, well, they're going to go in the home end. Just give us the fucking tickets already. But, uh, well, it seems like the people running Reading don't know what the fuck they're doing, so. There you go, it looks like we're going to be missing out, but the, uh, if you want to see this, it's from EFL.com. Uh, you click on that, uh, the word decision, that gives you the, the uh, that gives you the rules they were supposed to be following and all that stuff. I'm not really, I don't really care that much, uh, because they're kind of below us now. Um, it would be nice if one of the teams above us got, got stung, something like this, but if they did, you know it would be like it's suspended, and they wouldn't actually give them a points deduction. Um, but what can you do now? Moving on to this, also from Mill's official club website at millwc.co.uk. Obviously, it's March already. Can you believe it? It's it's the start of the third month of the year. Here we go. Uh, so we've got the uh, what's on in SC16 in March. Obviously, the coffee mornings are still going on. Uh, you can pop into uh, the den every Wednesday, more or less. And have a free cup of coffee and a biscuit or so, and just sit around uh, talking with other, other uh, people. Um, now, uh, obviously, it's this Saturday, so that first one was today, it already happened. Um, the next game, home game Saturday uh, against Norwich, big game, like I said, looking to be a sellout. Then another coffee morning, and uh, at the same time, a stadium tour. So the people on that tour will get to uh, see all the people having it in the coffee morning. Uh, and then obviously we've got uh, another midweek game. Uh, Swansea at home. At 7.45. Uh, that's the game where in the Lions Centre, Roy Lana will be signing books and doing a talk before that game. Um, Again, another coffee morning, and then on Saturday the 18th, another home game against Huddersfield. 
So our next three games, kind of strange, are home games. And then there's an international break, uh, which is good. The players can have a bit of a breather. And uh, yeah. And then there's an another couple of coffee mornings. So that's what's happening in uh, SE16 in March at the Den. Uh, talking of things happening at the Den, the Junior Lions Fun Day. They have a date for it. They've set a date. Um, taking place in the Lions Centre between 1.30 and 4.30 p.m. on Wednesday the 12th of April, uh, which is the day when the Super Saver on the season tickets uh, is uh, finishes. Uh, the event is open to Junior Lions, Lions season ticket holders and members only, but fear not, the opportunity to sign up and be available will be available on the day. There is no need to pre-book your attendance. Just turn up on the day and enjoy the free fun on offer with the first team squad also present. Details of the full rundown on the Junior Lions Fun Day will uh, follow in due course. We'll see you there. Um, interesting. Don't they normally do these on Sundays? Uh, so it's on a Wednesday. I assume that, that that must be some kind of... Oh, that's Easter holiday. Because like I said, um, Bank Holiday Monday is Easter Monday. is 10th. So that must be Easter holidays, yes? So they're, they're doing it then? Uh, I don't think they've done that before. They normally do it. I don't know if they're going to do it Easter themed. Um, I don't know. It's a couple of days after. Maybe not. But maybe they can get some uh, cheap Easter eggs from the shop or something. I don't know. But uh, there you go. Um, so yeah, save the date. Wednesday the twelfth. If you're still going to be in the country, if you're not leaving the country on, on a week's break to somewhere sunny. Uh, the Junior Lions Fun Day is happening uh, next to the den on that date. Now moving on to this from SuffolkNews.co.uk. Gary Rowett calls on Millwall players to step up for Zion Fleming Tom Bradshaw score yet again. Uh, each of the Lions' last seven championship goals have been scored by one of their joint top scorers. Uh, Gary Rowett was delighted that Zion Fleming and Tom Bradshaw were both able to find a new back of the net against Luton Town last night, but he has called on the rest of his team to contribute in the final third they are to secure a playoff spot. The duo are by far the top scorers in the squad so far this season with 12 each, while Duncan Watmore trails behind them with six, although five of them were for Middlesbrough. So that doesn't count. In my mind, that doesn't count. I don't know about you. If it's not for Millwall, it doesn't count. After that, Charlie Cresswell has the most goals in the Championship, having scored four times since joining on loan from Leeds United last summer. As a result, Rout is concerned but the Lions could struggle if Fleming or Bradshaw pick up an injury. I oh, don't say that. In the final weeks of the season, the latter are especially running on fumes as the only out and out striker in the club. Uh, da, 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 da. It's great to see Zoran to score again, uh, the manager said after last night's draw. I think that takes him to 12 and Bradders to 12 as well. So once more, they've been leading the line for us in terms of getting those goals. Uh, what we need to do is keep chipping in all over the park as well. Because clearly, if one of those did book an injury, uh, some, someone's going to have to step in. The players are working really hard. Everyone's working their socks off. I think you can see the amount of effort they're putting in. Uh, I think it's just about getting to Saturday in the hope that the players have enough uh, recovery to be able to go again. Indeed. Well, here's the thing. Uh, apart from Zion Fleming and maybe Vogel Sammer, who have you got that's creating stuff going forward? Um, not really. I mean, Romain Essay could he be? The, could he be the key? Um, I don't know, maybe. Um, yeah, don't know. Don't know. Watch up. What creative players have you got? Um, with the uh, assists. Don't really know. Um, now we're gonna move on to this story now. From bdcmagazine.com. Which is building design and construction. Exactly. And full planning permission issued for new Millwall FC training ground. Uh, I believe. So this story has been in a number of uh, industry publications and whatnot. I believe it's been put out uh, as a PR thing for the company uh, that Millwall employed to get it through. I think they're called Quad, Quod, whatever they're called, Quod. Um, and I think they put this out because this kind of getting planning permission on this massive thing 
where quite a few of the locals are not happy about it. The ones directly opposite. Um, it's a kind of it's a feat. It's something. It's an achievement. So they want to signal that to the rest of the uh, building world. Look what we've done. Uh, we can get things uh, through uh, all the various hoops and loops that you need to jump through. So, the planning team at law firm Irwin Mitchell has advised Mill UFC on its plans to build a new training ground in West Kingsdown near Brands Hatch in Kent, which has now been granted full planning permission. The Championship Football Club now has a green light to erect new state of the art facilities on the 50 acre plot that the club says will be amongst. The best in the country. Seven Oaks Council originally approved the plans for the construction of a training academy last October, but full permission was only granted today, Tuesday, yesterday, following the signing of an S106 agreement, basically a legalised bribe. Uh, the site of Falcon Road will include buildings for groundsmen and security, indoor and outdoor football pitches, artificial turf, and training areas. As well as a car and a cycle park in hard and soft landscape. At this rate, uh, maybe they should think about putting in the little hospital with all the injuries we've got, but uh, I don't know. The planning team advising on the scheme included Nicola Gooch, planning partner, and Erica Ives at Owen Mitchell, working with Joe Selby of Selby Projects, and Rebecca Burnham's Quo. Nicola Gooch said, we are delighted that this project can now proceed and Mill can create the state of art training complex which reflects the club's long term ambitions. Uh, the facility will help the club in its push to the Premier League and to develop the young players that will keep them there. It's been a long and complex process and we wish the club every success going forward. More information about the new trainings, ground site, and the club's extensive plans is found by clicking here. Which will take you to millwalltrainingground.co.uk, which is um, the thing that the club put up. I haven't been on in a while, I don't know if they've updated it um, with anything new, uh, I'm not too sure. But, so what's happened? What's happened? Well, here we go. This is the uh, form. This is the letter that the council sent to Millwall at uh, Quode on Mer Merge Street, Soho, W1F. Um, so here you go, uh, it's been permitted, uh, you've got three years from the date of this letter to, to start doing it, um, so uh, there's all the things you need to, uh, the things you need to uh, do and what can jump through, these are all the hoops, this is what I'm saying, look at the, all the hoops I had to, to go through, um, all of this stuff, um, not easy. They had to do all that stuff, surveys and, and all that nonsense, and get it through. Um, and here's the full letter. I'm not going to read it out because that would be boring as fuck. But if you wish to view it, you can go to Seven Oaks. Go to Seven Oaks District Council website. Go to planning applications. Go to uh, make a comment on the planning application. And search for the postcode TN156AY, which is the postcode of the site currently. Um, so then they set out all the circle and conditions and stuff. Um, you can see, oh, this I think it's just all normal stuff basically. Um, I don't know why it keeps going blurry as I come down, but um, so they need to have a lot of things set up. It says that the electric charger needs to be set up before they can move in. Um, various other shit and all sorts of stuff. It just keeps going and going and going. Um, they got to keep some of the hedgerows, all, all kinds of stuff. But there you go. The letter's dated 28th February, so that was the date that uh, that uh, the permission was granted. So there you go. 
and it just keeps going and going and going and there you go and if we go on to uh, this this is it this is the actual uh, section 106 agreement um, between Mill and the district council of seven acts so this is the legalized bribe that they've had to um, sign off on and agree to and uh, you can see all the stuff and then they go through all the definitions as we scroll down it keeps getting blurry or is, is that just me am I and then they get to all the stuff um, it basically what they've agreed to stuff and stuff maybe there's some stuff that I don't really I don't really know what the fuck if you're into all this stuff and you know what's going on if you're a, a, a policy wonk if you're a council geezer you know what what if can you have a look at this and see if it's all above board or if there's any funny business in here um I think what the club have agreed to is uh here the community li liaison often and we're, we're gonna get on that in a minute so they have to appoint one of them and has to be there throughout the lifetime of the development so this so looking through this this is a thing that that could be um They're allowed to have three months where they can't. They're without one because they, if they're, if like they're looking for a, a new one, um, they have to make a community benefit plan, and then they need to do a, a community benefit plan with Paul. Um, within three months of. The renewal date of the community benefit plan. So I don't know if that's yearly or when. Um, okay, I don't know. I don't know when that. I, I assume it's yearly, and they they need to do a so they need to come up with a plan how they're going to benefit the community. Then they have to do a thing every year where they say, uh, have they achieved? The things that are set out in the community benefit plan how's it going and then they have to here we go with the legalized bribes the owner shall pay the council the cbd monitoring fee upon submission of each updated community benefit plan be submitted so they have to pay so the club have to pay for this shit um to the council so you own the land you've got the approval but you still connect to the council you still have to pay that. You still have to pay. It's like DLC, downloaded content, um, gacha games, and all that stuff. You have to pay, even though it's your land. You own it. You own it. You're running it. You have to make payments to this council, in seemingly in perpetuity, um, because they let you use it. Uh huh. Even though it's not their land. They didn't sell it to us. They're just managing it in, in on behalf of the community. And the, some of the community didn't want it built. Want um, a massive thing there. I think they campaign, uh, campaigned against a solar farm being built there many years ago. So um, they have to come up. Yeah, this this uh, monitoring report. They have to come up with a management board. So they have to come up with a uh, like a board of trustees for the community benefit plan and guess what the people on that board have to be from from the council oh, is, and I, I, do they get paid to attend the board meetings and there you go it's money 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 they have to come up with an economic development strategy and the same thing, they have to do a monitoring report about that. So they have to come up with a strategy, and then they have to write a report saying, uh, we have achieved or not achieved our strategy because of this, 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 and this, and this. Um, they have to pay for um, works to the streets and stuff around the, around the, the site. To the council, of course. 
and again with the travel plan they have to come up with a travel plan and they have to pay, pay a fee to the council to monitor the travel plan you see what you are you seeing a pattern here you see why i call it a legalized bribe and here we go shuttle bus shuttle bus provision so they, they said they were going to have a shuttle bus um because even though they're building a massive amount of car park a massive car park with a lot of car park phases they basically told them they would run a shuttle bus to they said it was going to be longfield station but Hinesfield's closer but i don't think longfield is on straighter road so i don't know how they're going to do it so they're going to have like a minibus where they just uh, drive to and from to pick up all the um players the young players i guess um to take them to the, to the training ground and here's what um the council will have to do and uh, various situations and there's the signatures there um and here's here is the site in question which means that uh mill will now mill now uh, own a wood gallows wood i don't know if it's open to the public or if it's fenced off but that is a mill owned wood that is uh so there you go and um that is the site mill's new training ground be interesting to see uh, over, uh see it uh start to be built and here we go with the uh that's the last page there that's it now um it's already having an impact in terms of so the council put this out which is quite interesting they are seemingly kind of taking credit for this um because they're pushing it on the, on their their website this is from sevenoaks.gov.uk uh, free football classes for boys and girls. Just the two genders there for boys and girls. Good to see. Uh, join us at Mill Community Trust for 12 weeks of free football sessions run by a professional football coach. The course is available to children aged 8 to 16 of all abilities. They will be taking place at four locations across the district. No booking is required. Just turn up and have fun. So. The first one was actually today uh, at Edenbridge Recreation Ground, Coonfield, Edenbridge. And uh, that was Wednesday. Um, so it seems to be uh, every day they're going to move around the area. So obviously Wednesday's in Edenbridge. And it's 8 to 11 at 5 to 6 and 12 to 6 is 6 to 7. Uh, Hartley, uh, Woodland Avenue. That's on Thursdays. That's, so that's tomorrow. Again, similar uh, split in age range. New ha New Ash Green, the Minis, that's on Mondays, and Swanley, St Mary's Recreation Ground, St Mary's Road, on Fridays. Uh, children must be accompanied by a parent or guardian. And they said for more information, email blah blah blah. Um, these sessions are run by us, Mill Community Trust, and the local town and parish council. So there you go. They're getting in on it. They're getting in on it um so i don't know if they were doing this kind of thing before but uh it's being done now and me all community trust are getting involved in it so this is it there you go maybe they're looking for for talent for new talent but uh there you go so that's it for the news but we are going to move on to the stats from yesterday's game at luton and here we go this is from infogold.net. Uh, the, the XG, as you can see above the red FT in the middle, is 1.74 for Luton and 1.05 for Millwall. Again, Millwall massively um, outperforming their XG by about a goal. Luton kind of bang on. They got what they, they should have got from that based on the chances they created. If you go down to the goal map, you can see here it's Luton's chances. Um, trying to get in the middle and trying to get in the area um obviously they were putting some crosses in as well but not really coming in at the sides mostly everything was down the middle 
Um, the goal, obviously, coming off the bar, the guy tapped it in. That's that one there. And then the first goal from farther out on the date. Well, that was the second goal, actually. So, and they also had a good chance there. Drama, 58. Apparently, he was injured. Um, but, uh, so here's Mill's chances in comparison. Our, our best chance we scored. And then uh, we had a few smaller chances, which I'm going to think. Okay, that was Fleming. Yeah, that was Fleming's little stab at the ball, I think. Oliver Burke. And uh, who's that? That was Simon Fleming again. Um, but yeah, you can see massively... Uh, Massive difference there in terms of um, the shots we took and the shots they took. So, first half, restricted. And we only had two. So, even though it looks... It, it looks like we massively restricted them. We massively restricted ourselves because, obviously, we did what we did at Stoke. We go a goal up and we think, okay, we can, we can defend this lead. Um, with an attacking setup, not really, um, didn't really work out that way, did it? Second half, we go second half, and here they go. They, they probably figured out as, as well, if Mill were just going to defend and they're not going to have anyone up front, we can just do wave after wave, take your time, don't panic, get in the area and get your shot away. Try and get in behind there, get through them. I get in the area, then shoot. Don't shoot from far or afield. Because there's no point. Right, but here's, here's me wall in the second half. So we had a lot more chances as well. Um, but uh, was that a fair result? Fairness rating 85.03 out of 100. So they're saying it was a fair result. Um, I guess it was. Um, we did get a bit lucky. Um, the ref was kind of fair to us. They were a bit too fair. Um, but to be two 0 up, and then you've got you've got to turn the shutters on. Then you've got to, you've got to pull the shutters down, and you've got to you've got. To, we were doing it anyway, but bring the players on to do it. Make the defensive. Uh, substitutions but they came a lot later than two and we ended up drawing 2-2 two, two. Oh. that's fine now uh, this is from whoscored.com uh, Millwall stole the ball from the off uh, opposition off them strong at finishing, lost possession of them attacked through the middle, favoured long balls and Luton were effective, creating goal scoring opportunities from set piece situations and committed a high number of individual errors. If you can look on the right hand side, you can see uh, in terms of the shot charts, it's mostly uh, Luton players apart from Zion Fleming and the tackles, it's all Millwall. So obviously, we had a lot more defending to do. And dribbles is all Luton because they were the ones coming forward us. But uh, in terms of the top five ranked players, three of them are Millwall players and two of them. Are Luton players. So, in terms of attempts on goal, it's 15 to 9, 10 to 6 open play, 5 to 3 set pieces. So, Mill had 9 shots, 2 scored, that's 22% conversion rate. That is very high. Um, that's making the most of what you get, which is uh, what we need to do at the moment. Very important. So, they were mostly going down the left-hand side, even though Danny McMara was very good. So I don't know why they didn't change that up. Maybe they thought that it was working. I don't know. I thought personally, I thought Danny McMara had a very good game, um, and we were mostly going down our left-hand side as well. But not much as they were uh, shot directions, as, as you can see, them mostly in the middle. Us as well, though. Shot zones. Action zones. So look, we didn't get the ball up their end and keep it up there. Twenty percent in their in their third. Player positions. This, if you 
if you look at the Millwall one and then you look at the Luton one, it almost matches up perfectly. Um, we're pushed back on our right hand side, we're further forward on our left, and then vice versa for them. Um, I don't know if we can learn anything from that. Maybe we should have done more switching it, going from one side and then to the other side more quickly. Um, don't know to get in behind. I don't know. If Bradshaw's mostly playing down the middle, you probably want him to push over to that um, to his right hand to our right hand side to get uh, behind the 29 and the 45 of Luton, which you can see. For our second goal, if you see Danny McNamara runs forward, he runs inside. He plays it over to Vogelsammer. Vogelsammer plays it over to George Honeyman. George Honeyman plays it into Bradshaw. So zigzagging the ball from one side to the other, and then back over where the gap is. George Honeyman runs forward into the gap. Because Danny McNamara has picked up the ball, he's run forward with it, past the people who were trying to get past him. He took it off him and come forward with it. That's, there's a massive gap in front of him, but he hasn't got the legs to run forward. So he plays it over to the other side. And then George Honeyman moves over into the gap there. And then Vogel Salmon plays over to him. So we should, probably should have been doing more of that. But hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? You are always right if you use hindsight. Um, so let's have a look and see what happened. To here at a match events, obviously we scored in the fourth uh, minute, given a, an assist to Bradshaw. Interesting. I don't really know how he assisted with that, but I guess. Uh, and then Tom Bradshaw, scoring in 52 minutes. And then that's when the shutters should have come down, because six minutes later they scored, which is unfortunate, because uh, was it they come down the, uh, our left-hand side and whips the ball in on goal. George Long makes a save, uh, goes up onto the crossbar, comes down in front of the goal line. Oh, is it going in? Um, and that was the goal. So you can see when the ball comes over, it comes over from the left to the right for Luton. When the ball comes over, he actually hit Jake, Jake, Jake Cooper's hot, a hand. But he hasn't got his hand out, he's, he's like by his side, but still, that means he kind of stops for a second because he thinks, I've got a... Did anyone see that? Is that going to be a penalty? And then when the ball comes back in, he's like, uh, he's not really... He's a bit frazzled about giving up, maybe giving away a penalty, but I'm not blaming him, I'm not putting him on, I'm just... If you watch the highlights, you can see that and notice it for yourself, that when the cross comes in from one side to the other, uh, you can see it hits Jake Cube's hand, and that's why... When George Long makes a save and you've got Cooper and, and Murray Wallace running back, Cooper's a bit, he's, he's not switched on, that's why. And then even even after they've scored that goal and it's 2-1, we still have a lead to defend. They make three attacking changes and we don't we wait until they've made that third change before we respond and make uh, two changes of our own. And then we make two more changes, attacking changes, sort of. And then they end up scoring right at the end, which is annoying. Really annoying, but... hey ho um, So here we go. Match centre from whoscored.com. If you look at the top badge at the top left and top right, you can see the Luton players' average player rating is 6.52. And for me, what's 6.62? So it seems um, fair enough that that was a draw. Um, in terms of... Uh, so you can see the lowest player player rated for each team is actually the goalkeeper. So um, I guess um, something wrong with the goalkeeper in this game. Uh, if we look at so they've given a man of the match to, to Zion Fleming, which I think just because the amount of stuff he was doing, he was doing a lot up front, but defending as well, he was doing defensive work. Um, personally, again, I think I would probably give it to McNamara on just um, watching the game alone. Um, but he's further down the pecking order behind uh, Bradshaw and Hayman and Cresswell. So there you go. Now, in terms of 
production. Who did what on the pitch uh, yesterday? The total shots 15 to 9. So Fleming with five of our shots. And, uh, and then three other players having attempts on goal. And one sub as well. But for Luton, it's literally most of the team on the right hand side. So funny enough, they were coming down the left, but these players weren't taking shots. They were probably coming in across to, to whip the ball in. Uh, possession wise, again, really low because we were getting the ball and just pumping it forward to Bradshaw or to a Luton defender or to just empty space. Um, and in terms of the player who had the most possession for me, well, it's tied between. Honeyman, McNamara and Murray Wallace. George Long not far behind. Um, Pass success percentage again way down because of what was similar to the Stoke game. You can see, if you look at the stats, see, well, I can see what kind of game this was. Uh, Millwall just pumping it long because the passing accuracy is off and the possession was off. And yeah, the defenders and the goalkeepers passing accuracy is way down in the gut so there was no passing it sideways to each other there was just pumping it long um yeah dribbles 12 to 3 again no one running forward with the ball um aerials one wow massively out outnumbered here 30 to 19 30 to 19 and you've got Cresswell with six fleming with five bradshaw with three you can see the defender, um, three of the subs being involved. But in tackles, in terms of tackles, 9 to 32, it goes the other way because obviously we had a lot more, uh, we were giving the ball away. They didn't really have to tackle us to get the ball. We had to tackle them to get the ball and then we were just pumping it forward up to them to win the aerials. Um, so literally everyone in the middle team having a tackle for Bradshaw and Long. Um, corners six to two. These are the ones who soon won the corner. Um, so we only had two corners in a ninety-minute game, which is when you've got Gary out and other players need to chip in. Well, how can we have players scoring set pieces if we don't have any set pieces? You need to kick it into the corners to get players to run into the corner, get the ball, and then if if they can get across in, they can get across and can't get the win the corner. Uh, dispossessed 14 to 3 again. Them coming forward and having, and having the middle players take the ball 14 times and us only 3. Mm, so there you go. Moving on to the list of things with a bit more detail. So uh, let's have a look at what are we looking at. So ratings wise, we have 6 players on 7 or above. We've got Fleming, 7.79, Bradshaw. 7.67 uh, obviously so obviously they weren't on the pitch for 90 minutes they so Bradshaw he was only on the pitch for 75 minutes still managed to get a score of 7.67 with one goal and one assist but you have players on the, who were on the pitch for 90 minutes George Honeyman and uh, Chris Will and McNamara are slightly lesser scores and uh, what is the situation with the goalkeeper now? Is this just because his kicking was off? Because obviously he's kicking it to no one. You've got Bradshaw up front surrounded by three defenders. What can he do? What can you do? And you can see George Long is ranked lower behind Oliver Burke, Uncle Watmore, George Evans, Scott Malone and Sean Hutchinson. All of the substitutes got a higher score than George Long. And even Duncan Watmore, who was on the pitch for like four minutes. And it looks like he didn't do anything. He didn't even touch the ball. He's still got a higher rating than George Long. Yeah, he didn't touch the ball. His touches. So in terms of touch, you've got Murray Wallace 61, uh, Michael Lamar 59, 52, 50, 48. And there you go. So in terms of... So why is George Long's score so low? Let's go. So obviously Luton scored two goals. They had, what was it, 15 shots? If I remember correctly. So 15 shots they had. How many were on target? Four. So again, 50% of the shots that were on target 
went into the goal. Is that good or bad? Well, it's not the best, is it? But is there anything he could have done with them? I mean, he saved. It was a double. Uh, the the Ali Bayo goal, the, the one at the top there. So that's the goal that he scored. That that was the one that George Long saved, and he was in the process of recovering from that save. And it's up to the defenders to, to deal with that. He couldn't really. He made the initial save. Um. So, and then you've got obviously the, the Luke Berry goal. Probably could have done better with that. You've got all the middle players standing in front of him, blocking his view, and they're still not fucking dealing with the ball. They're, they're standing off the geezer, but the geezer puts it right into the corner. I mean, but he did save, apparently, maybe, the, well, I don't know if he saved this, because it may have been a blocked shot. You've got the Woodrow one. And the drama one. So I think the drama one was the one. I think the drama one was the one that George Long saved onto the crossbar that and Addy Bayo knocked in. So I don't know why George Long's score is so low. Um, so in terms of Millwall, what did we do? So we had what was it? Nine. Yeah, we had nine shots, and we had. Three shots on target. And two of them went in, so that's sixty-six percent. So that's pretty incredible that sixty-six percent of our shots on target went into the goal and became goals. Um, that's fantastic stuff. That's production. That is production. Um, moving on to this again. So I just got to uh, refresh this and hope that it comes back up. Uh, we will see. See if it works. Yeah. Uh, so were we offside? We we keep getting offside a fair bit. We were offside twice. Okay. Uh, unscheduled unscheduled touches, which basically poor ball control. Most of the team you got what, George Evans with one, who's barely on the pitch. Um. Defensive-wise, who did what? We've seen Danny McNamara, seven tackles. You'd love to see it. Uh, interception of three. But look at, so we've got all of these players having tackles. Leonard with five. Cresswell with four. Honeyman with four. Vogelson with four. Everyone, look, Simon Fleming as well getting involved in the defensive work. Two tackles. Uh, interceptions. Again, McNamara's top of the list, along with Leonard, Cresswell. Murray Wallace. Fort Lenders was pretty good today, seeing as he hasn't started for a while. Um, clearances. Charlie Cresswell, six. Cooper with five. So again, Cooper not really doing much. Had two tackles, zero interceptions, but on the clearances, again, he's there. Five. Um, block shots, zero. So block shots, so. We blocked two, three, four of the shots. Were blocked. And you got Ryan Leonard there, top of the list. Now, moving on to passing. Uh, obviously, the passing is way down, way, way down. Not only that, but George Long is the second most passes for Millwall. That is not good. I'll tell you what, um, we certainly missed Billy Mitchell. We needed someone who could, and George Savile, we missed both. Certainly someone who could get on the ball and pass it around. Um, we could pick a pass, open it up. That's Billy Mitchell. That's what he does. And see, without him, we're just pumping it long to no one, um, which is not ideal. So the the passing is way down. You've got uh, Jake Cooper being on the pitch for ninety minutes, only having eleven passes to make. That is incredibly low. Again, Cresswell twenty seven. Most of these are much or much, they're all the same, really. Um, in terms of, so obviously the accuracy is way down. But you've got <laughs> Scott Malone with the highest, with over, but that's four passes. But to be fair, in what was 10 minutes on the pitch. But in terms of accuracy, you've probably got a point to George Honeyman the, with the gold medal there, 71 for 31. Pretty decent. Uh, in terms of crosses and accurate crosses, um, not really. Again, George Honeyman two and two. 
Everyone else is uh, not very good. Uh, long balls and accurate long balls. What any of them are accurate? So here we go. We've got George Long, 30 long balls. So 31 passes, 30 of them were long balls. One was a short pass. He's got 16% accuracy off that. There's only four of them were accurate, meaning they, they found a, a mill player. Um, obviously, if you're passing into space, this kind of skews the situation. Uh, but Murray Wallace 12 and 1, Mac 9 and 3. You see, they're just pumping balls forward to no one in particular. You've got Scott Malone 2 and 2. So Scott Malone, when he come on, not bad numbers for 10 minutes on the pitch. Um, not bad at all. So, um, there you go. That's the tale of uh, Luton Town. To me all two told in stats and on that note thank you for watching and goodbye.